Okay, I think we're live. Hello, everyone. This is a, a little bit of a different format. It's been a, um, as the kids would say, it's been a hot minute since my last recording here. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and do this podcast with uh, video format as well. So we'll be able to split it up into different pieces and you can hear the audio uh, as usual on the podcast website or on iTunes. And also to be able to see the video in different formats on Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and, and others. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and just get right into it and introduce our special guest for today, Laura Grant out of Raleigh. North Carolina. How do you say it? Raleigh? Raleigh? Raleigh. 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 <laughs> um, it's a little bit different everywhere you go. So Laura has, um, you know, most people watching this probably know who Laura is and, and know who her husband Jonathan Grant is. Uh, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, you know, this, this, is, this case has become well known. And we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of what it is. But I, I would so like to welcome Laura because, um, Laura, I commend you for being such a beacon of uh, hope and, you know, just, just a, a resource for so many people going through what you've been through and what you continue to go through and really, uh, you know, utilizing this platform that you've been, that you've been blessed with, that you've been given uh, because of the circumstances, but using it as, a, as tr a tremendous force for good. You know, as we know, lots of people have platforms in this world, you know, politically and otherwise, and, you know, sometimes they're used for good and other times not so much, but you um, of all the accounts I've seen on Instagram in particular, uh, your account is is just the most incredible beacon of hope and force for good I've seen out there. So I thank you for doing what you're doing, what you're doing. And you could tell it comes from a, a true place of love and faith and hope. And, uh, you know, you're just your, your story speaks for itself. Your story, meaning yours and John's story speaks for itself. So welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for being on, on the show thank today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if let's just get right into it. Um, are you, uh, are you, um, willing to just give a little bit of a backstory. What's been happening in the last couple of years of your life uh, between you and uh, Jonathan and um, just kind of um, set the stage because I know most people have an idea of what's going on, but there's plenty of people I see every day, people asking what happened, what happened, what happened. Right. So just a little brief right. backstory if you would. Absolutely. So, you know, John um, was a Navy SEAL and we lived out in California. We moved back to Raleigh and John was working down in Fayetteville. It's about an hour from our house, commuted there every single day. Um, one night um, after, after work, I was teaching Pilates because that's what I do, or I did, right? I taught Pilates and gyrotonics, so I always had a background in movement. And again, I think that was just a part of the journey ahead, right? Um, but he went downtown to have dinner with a buddy and on their way home that night, um, his buddy was driving and he lost control and they did a lot of flips and turns. It was just a one car. We think it was speed related, um, two miles from our home and they ended up hitting a tree. John was unconscious at the scene. Um, the driver came to, he doesn't remember anything. So, you know, there's a lot of questions like what happened? There's no answers which you know that's okay um but i got a call in the middle of the night my husband was unresponsive and i think they thought that we were local they're like well if you're are you nearby and i said yeah i live here and they're like well you need to get to the hospital now so really john stayed at that point he was at glasgow three which is the lowest they can get um no response whatsoever respiratory failure um, they had intubated him three times and they weren't actually getting any success at that point. Um, anyway, so it, you know, that, that was a darkness. Um, that's what happened the accident wise from there. So many different complications have come about. Um, but he had, um, diffusal and axle injury where the whole brain just shook in the car. So from there, we have gone through the healthcare system, John being in the service, we have dealt with, um, being in rehab facilities for over a year. John just became um, very agitated. He got stuck in that uh, pattern of just everything was overstimulating to him. We were making no progress. We were getting worse and worse. He was sent to a neurobehavioral center and got worse and worse. Um, I just knew that I needed to get him home and I knew that there needed to be other approaches that took place. And from there, you know, look where we are now. And we can fill in those blanks, you know, in the timeline. But that's kind of where we're at is John's just healing from a severe traumatic brain injury. He should never have survived from. Right. Right. 
It's amazing. And we hear that so often. The brain, the body is, is such an amazing thing. Um, you know, forces behind the brain and the body are, are such amazing things. Uh, and it's really, uh, we just never know how people are going to, uh, you know, survive these types of things. Right. So. And it's also, I feel like a lot about the, who that person was before, you know, like the right. uh, willpower that person mm -hmm. has too, right? Yeah. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. And obviously you talk about Navy SEAL, the constitution of a Navy SEAL, and uh, their, their just fortitude mentally, physically, otherwise. Um, there is so much to be said for how someone is prior to an injury uh, related to how they, how they fare after the injury, for sure, particularly in the long haul recovery that right. you're in the throes of right now. Yeah. Right, right, right. So when did you, um, you know, there's, there's been a journey for answers here. You just talked about, you know, just kind of getting to the place you're at right now. When did you know you needed something more from the, the norm? We get calls all the time from people that, you know, all of a sudden they're getting all of these services and then things just go away. And then they say, you know, you have to bring this person home. You have to take care of them. But there's no, there's no how-to book. There's no guidebook. There's no understanding of what should be done. So when did you know you needed something more beyond conventional standards and and really where did when did that journey begin well actually in icu it did for me because having the background of pilates um you know i was all about like we need the organic feeding too we need all this but honestly the difficult part is when you're in that state of trauma and this, this is what i really think people need here and i think that we're, we're going to be able to educate people is even if the healthcare system says it's not available, it is available in some sort of way. There, there are other ways to do this. Um, unfortunately, at that point, I didn't know, right? So I just kind of went with the doctor said, and but I kept on questioning all along. Sadly, um, there's pros and cons to this, but John being an um, active duty at the time, we, um, we were given a lot of resources. But because he was in healthcare facilities, I wasn't able to reach outside the box. I was, we were stuck in the box. So once I got him home, that's when I was like time to take over and reach out and get more help in other areas. Um, so to answer your question, when did I know that we needed something else from the beginning, but it was just a matter of having the ability to reach outside of the healthcare system. Right, right. So, yeah. you know, where, where was it then? How did you actually find these resources? Now, you're in the, the Pilates arena, you're in the, you know, alternative complementary um, healthcare uh, fitness arena. So, where, you know, where did you find these initial resources? We're, we're getting calls all the time from folks that are uh, or have loved ones in hospital settings and others like when you were in ICU, and we can begin to counsel them before they transition. Uh, but, but how did you go about doing that? Right. Um, oh, let's see. I mean, I remember even when he was in the rehab facilities, I was questioning like, oh, could we take him to this place or can we take him to that place? Again, I think that insight and that wisdom, just because of my background, I was able, I had the idea of these other um, resources. But honestly, you know, I first got into the functional medicine um, with Dr. Daigle when somebody, another veteran reached out to me on Instagram and said, we have a guy that I want you to meet. And then from Dr. Daigle, it's just been kind of meeting all of you along the way. Um, so, gosh, I, I just tell everybody that I talk to now, if you could do anything at the beginning is to reach out and get a functional um, medicine doctor or a functional neurologist on board to look at the body as a whole. Right, right. That's so important because, you know, as we know, again, conventionally, the it's absolutely critical that people have those initial stages of care because of bleeds, because of uh, you know physical traumas, et cetera. But beyond that, um, there's very little to offer, and and you know we have the understandings that when somebody has a hit to the head or a, a more severe penetrating head injury, diffuse axonal injury, it's not just the head, it's not just the limbs, you know, it's the gut, it's everything else, the emotional brain, et cetera. So uh, I'm so glad that you were able to get on that path and and that you're able to share this now with everyone through your resources with Instagram, the website, the Stay, uh, Stay Strong Johnny Grant website, and some others. So uh, thank you for, again, sharing these things. And I mean, I, I, you know, thinking back, and I, you know, one of my biggest purposes of this platform, I feel like is, you know, you guys have these tools that, you know, they, first off, you, you can't replace you guys, but there's these tools that even in 
when you're stuck in the healthcare system or anything like that, there are tools to do like playing certain frequencies, you know, and doing figure eights and all these different things that you guys have this capacity of sharing to other people. Um, right. Right. Amazing. You know, it looks, I, I can't say that I, I regret that not having it before, but I don't want anybody else to not get it until two years later. Yeah. Understood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we just talked before this recording, you know, I just spoke with the person up in New York and um, we have no ability to get to them at the moment. They have no ability to come here, but we can start the process by getting them right. tools like low level lasers for home use, that kind of thing, uh, just right. to get the process started until, until that point, hopefully they can, they can do something about it. Okay. Right. So, um, there's so many questions I want to ask you. My goodness, we have uh, we've we've had so many conversations, and there's so many things I want to ask you to be able to, you know, help people understand the journey you've been through. What, you know, from a um, from a caregiver standpoint, what people that are are new to this type of situation, every story is so different. But what should people expect? Yeah, I mean, I know that's a big question. That's a loaded question, but. You know, what should people expect as, as best as you can uh, address that? I think um, initially what you should expect is your energy is going to play a big part on their healing. Right. So whatever you give to that individual is going to play a big part of moving forward. You are becoming their voice, right? Um, so the caregiver, I feel like, is one of the strongest pieces to the puzzle to get the resources, to get going in the right direction. You have to advocate. You have to, you know, not take no as an, an answer. John always told me no is um, just one step closer to a yes. And I've always held on to that, you know. Um, when I was getting no's and knew that there was more, I just kept on pushing forward. Um, so you're honestly, a head injury is is one of the most life-changing things but um it's full time my husband is pretty severe you know there's others that i feel like along the way just like a concussion we'll talk about i you know if as a caregiver if you get them into someone like you right away then you're not going to have those lifelong you know struggles um so i think the biggest thing i would say to expect is it's just going to be it's going to be a lot for a while, but knowing that <laughs> the more you advocate and get through it, the better it's going to get. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I know, again, that was a, a huge, huge question. That's a huge question. It is. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but yes, and, and you hit the nail on the head, and and nothing has obviously been you know pre rehearsed or anything here. And I love that you said that because I've been at this twenty years, and the fact is, in the vast majority of cases, even though we can't compare one case to the next because there are so many differences, um, the one common denominator is the the greater the support system, the greater the recovery. That's just the way it goes, and. Not everybody is as as lucky and blessed as you all are to have a rock star like you uh, as a support system for him and your mother and other people involved and other people we see that have entire families around them, you know, communities around them. Uh, for every one of those, there's another person who doesn't have anybody around them. Uh, and I would love to, you know, be able to find a way eventually where we can have a, you know, a caregivers network where we have people that come in and, and, and advocate and work for and be the voice for that person like you're talking about. Yes. Having a voice is very important um, because that individual at that point, their main focus needs to be the healing. So, right. you know, just giving them, um, because there's a lot of legwork as a caregiver, you know, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of appointments, there's a lot of things that happen. Um, but yeah, just taking it on. And I also would say, you know, for caregiver is the other thing is <clears throat> as much as it's like, oh, poor me and stuff, you've got to again, remember that energy is going to affect that loved one as well. So right. just trying to stay strong as you can, knowing that you're going to get through it, yeah, and taking so care of yourself. That said, and from somebody who is so used to taking care of themselves, this is the question I was actually going to ask you later on. I think you know what I'm going to ask here um, is, you know, the self-care. How do you take care of yourself so that you can maximally benefit or advocate for that person that you're talking about having to do at a high level? You know, because there's a point where energy just goes away. If we don't make, you know, if we don't help create it, it's going to go away. Right. 
you know, I find time every day to move and that's really important to me, even if it's not like what I'm used to doing before the accident happened. Um, that might mean giving John some worksheets and I get on the treadmill and just watch him, you know? So I think moving is very important. Um, and asking for help and asking and also having, you know, a lot of, I remember at the beginning of the journey, people are like, you need a therapist to talk to. And I was like, you know what? That's the last thing I want to do. And I think caregivers hear that and they know it's like the last thing you want to do is talk through it. Right. right? Cause you're in such, it's like, the, it's draining. Yeah. Um, but I found a new, you know, you got to find what works for you. Massages worked for me. That was just a quiet time that I just check out. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is also, um, I do energy healing work that, you know, I work with the therapist with that. And then the other thing, as far as taking care of yourself, I, the biggest advice I can give a caregiver is don't carry all the weight of all the advice that comes in. Trust that when it's time, you'll know. And I mean, when John was in his agitated state, somebody told me, you've got to remember it's his journey too. You can't fix it. So not putting all the weight on you that, oh my gosh, I need to do this and this and this. Just trust it. Trust the process. Trust, trust like you guys as doctors and stuff, just trust it and allow it to happen and know that it will unfold. Right. Excellent. That's great. And that just brings me back to, you know, buying a house, getting married, having kids, you know, everybody comes at you with all the stuff that is the, the best way to do it. And the fact is you have to take it in, take it in, but you know, you have to live the journey yourself. Yeah. Right. And then also not putting too many eggs in the basket or whatever, however people say it, you know, like find your core people and don't, you know, you're going to get advice from every single Avenue. But, um, I just, I, I think just, you know, staying, um, I have a folder on my email that says advice people have sent me and I just drop them all in there. And I know that if I need them, I go to that folder. Right. Right. Let me ask you a question. Okay. How's that? Sound? That sounds good. Sounds good. How about this? Um, what have you found to be the top three <clears throat> factors to healing any kind of injury? I mean, I know you work with a lot of neuro injuries, um, which I think, Every injury has a piece into the neuro because everything comes from the brain. But what would be your top three factors to healing? Um, top three. Number one, as you know, just coming into our facility, the first word you see is hope coming in. Um, that for me is that's the ultimate factor right there, because if the individual and or the caregivers do not have that, then there's nothing we can do. You know, that, that's where things end. Uh, we can't wave any magic wands and make people um, do things they don't want to do, especially if they don't believe there is something on the other side for them. Uh, and that comes in varying degrees. If there's just a little bit of it, we can help, you know, we can help build that. Uh, they can help build that. Uh, important um, support system, like you said, uh, you know, whether it's a, a child with learning and behavioral issues, whether it's somebody with brain injury, if they don't have a support system around them, uh, you know, parents, teachers, brothers, sisters, friends, um, that's going to make things a lot more difficult. That is a critical part of the healing process. And um, three, and um, maybe in not in any particular order, but providers, health providers that are going to be partners in the journey, you know, not doctor here and patient here, but, you know, partners in a journey. That's why we've, over the years, we've even used the word clients. Uh, you know, we use patients, clients, however, but we always look at people as being a part of the process, just like you would go to an accountant and work with them. You're their client, but you work with them for your best interest or benefit. We see the same. We're a hired professional that has resources that can help that individual, um, but they have to partner with us. And if they don't, you know, then, um, then we can't help them either because then it's just a vicious cycle of things. I tell people all the time, as I've told you and, and, and uh, you know, hope to see it happen at some point, you know, we love seeing you, but we hope to never see you again uh, because so no, we know that that partnership has gone well. Right. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think another thing that a lot of people ask me all the time is, um, and we, we touched on it as you asked me for a caregiver, what to expect. And, but what a lot of people ask me, where do I get started? How do I, I mean, especially at the beginning, and you touched on it a little bit, you know, reaching out, getting connected, sending lasers out. But a lot of people in these situations, like, first off, I always tell people, I send them these links of like emerging consciousness because people don't know. 
I'm saying for a TBI as severe as John's, but just people um, at the beginning of any like traumatic injury, where do they start, would you say? Uh, it's, you know, a good place and a bad place is the internet, as you know. I mean, it's a, du- it's a double-edged sword. Um, and that's what can really lead people down rabbit holes um, that may or may not be productive. I'm not saying what we do is a fit for everyone, but the fact is, you know, seeking out qualified healthcare practitioners is critical. Also, people that are willing to talk with them prior, like myself and Dr. Daigle and uh, Dr. Siegler and all these names, Dr. Crawford, uh, this kind of network of functional neurologists that you've uh, worked with over time. These are very um, compassionate, open-minded, highly motivated to educate people, regardless of whether they ever see that person or not. So not for secondary gain, but just because of that Um, that that desire to help and give people information and have them spread information. So, you know, qualifications, I think, are critical. People want to do too much too soon and they go, you know, here for a little bit and there for a little bit. And then they, well, they say, well, I did that. It doesn't work. I did that. It doesn't work. But they need somebody to really oversee the case, so to speak. And I really think, particularly in the brain injury realm and some other realms, learning and behavior, cognitive impairment, in my humble opinion, uh, functional neurologists are best equipped to, uh, to do this because they understand conventional approaches. They understand complementary and alternative approaches. Um, they have access to numerous modalities that are just not the mainstream. They are rooted in the literature. They are peer reviewed, evidence-based, however you want to look at it, but they're just not common conventional treatment. So I think seeking the services of a functional neurologist, people can always contact me and I can get them in touch with someone near them. They can contact Dr. Daigle and do the same. But um, that's a good, really good first step. Um, I do caution people uh, just on this note in, in I think some of the online forums and things like that can be quite helpful, but by the same token, um, they can be quite damaging for folks because again, everybody's throwing this advice at you. You need to do this. You need to do that with good intentions. But the fact is none of these folks um, are versed in anatomy, physiology, neuroplasticity, uh, you know, diffuse axonal injury, et cetera. They live through experience and I'm not downplaying that at all, but you have to take that advice like you said and just kind of file it away until you get the services of someone who studies this stuff every single day. Yeah, hope that answers. That makes, you know, you touched on two things there. Um, one being, you know, we've tried this, we've tried this. I encourage people, don't hold that I've tried it, meaning you'll n- never need it, right? So I think that one thing, you know, just like with the eye exercises we do, right now we need the foundation, but that doesn't mean we won't go and do the other ones he was doing once before. You know what I mean? So understanding the process for one individual is going to be different than for the other individual, right? So a being open-minded and being willing, I think is a big thing because people are like, well, we tried that. It didn't really do anything. Well, at that moment in that time in healing, it didn't, it wasn't needed, right? Exactly. Exactly. Just being open, that understanding everybody's injury is different. Right. And that's another thing when you talk about these forums and talking about, you know, I think having a doctor look at the whole picture is key. Mm-hmm. Not just treating that one specific thing. Um, yeah, I think that's for caregiver is very important because again, this overwhelming of figuring it all out, right? And then holding on to experiences, and you know, you got to let go of the experiences and be open for a new experience. Yeah, and that that's uh, you know, just playing on that a little bit too. We have speech and language pathologists, um, psychologists, and many other occupational therapists that we've had conversations with, and they say when when we can do the type of work we do, their jobs become easier, so to speak. So like you said, stage of change or stage of development or stage of recovery is critically important because speech may, may not have worked you know, two months after the accident, but it may work a year after the accident when somebody now has the foundational neurological capacities to you know, coordinate all of these muscles and brain to muscle, uh, you know, things that happen, which are incredibly complicated, um, but they can work better at different times. So sometimes people go in, try to just, you know, jam the rehabilitation through and it doesn't work. And then again, it just, you know, it, 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 it 
puts it in a, you know, they throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. And that, that's exactly, you know, what I was telling um, for John uh, all along, you know, being in these rehabs, they wanted to make him walk. They wanted to make him stand for a long time. They wanted to make him talk and all these different things. And I kept saying to the doctors, it's not firing correctly. Like you're asking him to do tasks he's not capable of doing. And that's when you guys came on board um, and started healing that brain. He had, he can do it. We just had to get, start healing that brain to allow that capacity for him to do that. Right. Yeah. yeah it's the, the square peg into the round hole kind of thing. You know, <laughs> we, we've got to slice the edges off the square peg and it, it'll fit in there eventually. Yeah. Right. I'm just turn some light on in here because it's getting dark. There we go. It is okay. getting dark earlier now. All yeah. right. So what else, did you have any other specific questions you wanted? Let's see. Um, I think, um, do, do, do. gosh, there's so many things I want to ask you. Um, Oh, how about neuro fatigue? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, any, people. Yeah. Um, any, any specific direction you want to go with that? Because you've obviously been well versed in this. Um, I think uh, people understanding neuro fatigue, you know, in the world we live in today, it's like fight through pain, keep going harder, more, this and that. And understanding, um, I think for one of those, the simplest things you told me one time when I was there, and I held on to this, um, you know, that thing with John's hand with the squeeze and extend. And you said, once that hand stops doing that full extension, stop, you know, because that's, you don't want to send a pattern of what we don't want. And I think that's very key. Even if it's a one time we do it and you can't do it again, that, you know, that simple thought pattern of don't push you don't want to make a pattern that's going to cause a pattern we don't want. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, no pain, no gain does not apply to neurological rehabilitation for somebody who's, you know, fit and training for a sport, lifting weights, whatever. Yes. No pain, no gain. You got to feel some burn to get stronger. You need some level of therapeutic stress to, to move to the next level. Well, that is very different when it comes to the brain. Um, metabolic rate, fatigability, that type of thing. These are things that we can look at, not just in the individual. They may say, oh, I'm tired, or I don't want to do this, or they may start performing a little bit lower on certain tasks or tests. Uh, but we can look at blood pressure, heart rate, breathing patterns. Uh, we can look at their pupils. We can look at all kinds of things to indicate that they've hit a wall, oftentimes before they actually hit that wall. So we don't want them to hit that wall. We want to just go up to that wall and then let it be, and then do it again and again and again. But yes, we need to pay absolute respect to the nervous system because the nervous system is, you know, the brain has been called the greedy master, meaning um, it uses a disproportionate amount of fuel compared to the rest of the body. So this little 2% of our body weight up here can burn through, you know, 25, 30% of the oxygen and sugar that we take in. Uh, now you injure that brain, it might be 40%. You know, you have faulty eye movements, it might be 50%. So that is burning through a heck of a lot. So once you, and a nerve cell is very different. When you fatigue a muscle, uh, that muscle just doesn't work anymore. It gets weak. It doesn't do its job anymore. When you fatigue a nerve cell, it actually starts to kind of pull back on its connections a little bit. Thank goodness we have tens and thousands of connections between nerve cells. So if you lose a few, it doesn't really matter. But if you keep fatiguing and fatiguing and fatiguing these cells, they're going to grow apart. You know, these connections between the cells are going to get less and less and less. So we're actually creating damage by overdoing it. So that's a critically important process. And sometimes you can see it in the people that you're working with, particularly when you've been doing it as long as you have. Um, but you need to pay attention to autonomic signs and symptoms, you know, sweating, um, all kinds of things that'll key you in, especially if that person can't talk or relate. Um, and particularly in cases like John's, you know, where he's a fighter, he's not going to tell you he's tired. He's going to go, 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 go. And um, you have to figure it out at times for him. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I've run into, in situations, um, a lot of people that I've talked to, other um, TBI, you know, the caregiver, and they talk about, you know, we've gone two years, three hours of rehab a day, seven days a week, and all this, and I'm like, you might just need to chill out. You're like, there's, it's okay to take a day of rest and not, you know, I think people need to understand, like, balance really in a TBI. It doesn't mean, I, I 
you know, some people say, if you don't move it, then you're going to lose it. Right. But sometimes I found with John, sometimes he just needed two days of his just like turn off. Right. Yeah. Just let him be. Cause that's part of, they're also a person as well. And I think that's important to let them do what they want to do rather than always saying, okay, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do that. So, you know, when we come to your clinic, I just, I, I respect you in so much of how you run it because it's like, okay, a little, this rest, a little, this rest. And that gives him really a time to, you know, really get the full benefit of everything. Right. Yeah, it is critically important. And also too, you know, forcing therapies, uh, you know, there's, there's folks that go for certain types of therapies for X period of time. And it's not to say these therapies are inherently bad. They're actually amazing therapies, speech, PT, OT. We love these therapies. We refer people all the time for these therapies, but again, at the right time, kind of piggybacking on what we said before, uh, because you know, again, many people will try to, to go through it, uh, just like whether it's neurofeedback or something like that. I've had people come to me and say they've been through 150 sessions of neurofeedback. And then I think to myself, you know, we, 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 we practice neurofeedback. We love that people are doing it, but there's a point where either it's not working or it's too much. Um, so, you know, we need to be able to understand that. And you can have fatigue with any kind of modality. It doesn't have to be a physical modality. In particular, the cognitive-based modalities, cognitive therapies, neurofeedback, things like that can be inherently fatiguing, but a lot of practitioners don't see it as such. Um, so we have to be able to monitor that as well. And instead of doing three sessions a day, maybe do two. You know, it really is dependent on what we're seeing. Right. I think that's really key um, and also helpful for caregivers that feel like they have to do everything all the time, you know, right. and um, like I, I see people that they just put their loved one on, say, a standing frame and make them stand for an hour and their posture's all off. And maybe that we can go straight into maybe about the eyes from here, because um, I know that when John was in rehab, John was just, it was like, you know, we had all this agitation going on, but for some reason, my instincts were saying, how about if he's not seen correctly? How about if he's not seeing the world around him correctly? And we know that the eyes guide the body and the eyes are the gateway to the brain. And, you know, how about if it's double vision or whatever? And sadly, they were not checked until two years later when I had to ask to get them checked. Um, I had to go out on my own to do that. But I, maybe talk about the importance of the eyes earlier on and just how um, how important that is to, you know, to get a loved one standing up. Like you're asking them to stand up, but how about if their vision is not there? Right, or the, right. Right? So just like the layers of healing a brain injury, you know, you've got to work with the foundation before you can ask the next piece of it. Yeah. And particularly with uh, diffuse axonal injury and even getting into, you know, I don't like the word, but mild traumatic brain injury, concussion. Um, we've seen some concussions that can be just as severe as uh, from an eye movement standpoint as something that John has been through because of involvement of the brainstem. So the thing that connects your big brain to the spinal cord, you've got your brainstem that houses all the centers for eye movements, visual integration, uh, you know, aspects of your, your balance and vestibular systems, all your cranial nerves, all the, you know, the things that um, serve everything in your face and head and neck. Uh, so this is really important because there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And if you have traction injuries to it, you're going to have problems with um, not necessarily vision per se, but the movements of the eyes. So you had his vision checked out and then we're able to get that part corrected. And then beyond that, it was things that we looked at, getting the cameras on the eyes and seeing when we can blow those eyes up, we're seeing his eyes just constantly, constantly moving. Oscillations, uh, that's not good because when you have a brain, particularly one that's trying to stand on two feet and resist gravity, which is very difficult to do, uh, that whole world, as far as the brain is concerned, is not stable. It's shaking, doesn't like it. And, and there are so many compensations being made just to keep him up on those two feet. So until that's stable, walking can never be stable. Balance can never be stable. So it's so critically important to look at that. And, uh, you know, many people, even without the big fancy equipment, you can start to see these things or, uh, you know, uh, adept clinicians can start to see these things bedside. I've had a lot of people say, uh, you know, they came in, they have a brain injury, they were checked out and they said, oh, the eyes were fine. And all I do is just this cardinal fields of gaze, have them follow my finger. And there's nothing fine about it because the eyes are constantly shaking as they're trying to follow. So uh, just noticing those types of things is critically important. And not just from a stability standpoint physically, but a, f a stability standpoint emotionally. It's hard to have emotional stability, hence the agitation that he had going back 
when the visual environment is unstable. 70% of learning comes through these things right here, the eyes. And if, if it's unstable, it's going to have its consequences physically, psychologically, mentally, cognitively, and so on. So much. I mean, yeah, the eyes. I, it's funny. Are we, am I, John actually did carvings before this injury. And we'll, All right. really great. And I had him carve one, and I'm going to have to show it to you. But it says, where the eyes go, the body follows. And it actually has two eyes on there. Oh, wow. That's cool. <laughs> that is so you know, cool. Yeah. The eyes are so important. So yeah. important. Absolutely. So, uh, Absolutely. I think, um, that has been a huge part for John. And, you know, because you look at John, because John did get his eyes checked when he was in rehab and it was more just for vision. And they were like, they're perfect, right. you know? And I'm like, but how about all this other stuff? They're, there's, they're like, there's no way to check. So right. to caregivers, when you hear no way to check, because I got, when it came, comes to the gut, I was told there's no way to know if he's absorbing. There's no way to know this. Just know there is a way. If, you're, if your gut or instincts is telling you something needs to be looked at, again, if it's a no, that's just a closer to a yes. There yes. are clinicians out there that know right. and that can help. And if they don't know, that the, the ones that you want to be around will get you to that next person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I know we're, we're coming up on time here. Do you have any, any last minute questions? Oh, I, know, I know I've got one for you, but I'm going to save that for the end. I feel like we just started. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Um, um, let's see. Da, da, da. <sighs> um, maybe you want to talk about neurofeedback because you kind of specialize in that and tell people kind of what it's about. Because, um, you know, there's different ways people do it and, just speak a little bit about the neurofeedback that you've been doing with John and it's really helping us, him a ton. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that was one of those things too, you know, initially with John, we weren't sure if it was going to have an impact right. because we don't have any, um, you know, we can't have that dialogue about it in terms of, you know, what his experiences are going through it. Uh, but the fact is objectively, we have his brainwave activity that we can look at. So uh, with regard to neurofeedback, as you know, um, everything we do is driven by um, EEG assessment. So we get the caps on the head and we measure electrical activity in the brain, all your delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, all the different brain waves. And then we do comparisons. We do some crunching of the numbers on our own. We can do some imaging with the electrical output, the SLRED imaging that I showed you. You know, we can see real time what's happening with um, changes in electrical activity in certain parts of the brain. Uh, but also too, we can do comparisons. So we can take his brain waves and compare them to other guys his age that haven't had brain injury and see where he stacks up compared to the norm. So. Um, if we see excessive amounts of beta brainwave activity, which is our kind of faster processing brainwaves, um, that can tell us maybe heightened states of, you know, vigilance and anxiety, that type of deal. Uh, he might have uh, decreased alpha activity, and uh, that would indicate maybe attentional deficits. Some people, particularly when they're not sleeping well, which is most, particularly more in the concussion, post-concussion realm, uh, people aren't sleeping well, they carry around excessive amounts of delta and theta activity. Now you throw medications on top of all this, you're gonna change brainwave activity even more because you know, what do the, the benzos do? You know, they, they decrease anxiety by decreasing beta activity and increasing theta and, and doing those types of deals. So <clears throat> there's so much to talk about here, but neurofeedback in essence is, allowing someone the ability to control or regulate their own brainwave activity, even people that can't communicate. Because the fact is he, he cognitively understands what we're telling him as we're going through this, and he locks on to this um, type of training like nobody I've seen. So we see the intensity of his follow through with the actual exercises, but now we can go right to the computer monitor and see too, is he in fact changing his brainwave activity? Are there positive things happening? Uh, in his case, we're trying to generate what we call SMR or sensory motor rhythm activity, 12 to 15 hertz. It's a really tiny brainwave range, but it's a critical brainwave range. And that's the brainwave that they identified about 50 years ago as uh, the basically the cat before it pounces type of brainwave activity. So when you have that intense focus, yet nothing's happening and they're actually fully relaxed and then they're about ready to spring into action, that's that brainwave right there. It's between alpha and beta. It's that, you know, kind of undefined range. And SMR has been classically shown to reduce seizure activity, increase focus and attention, uh, increase muscle activity, great for sports training. 
so with John, we do these things prior to his, we do the SMR training specifically prior to his workouts, uh, even though they're not intense gym kind of workouts, but doing his exercises so that his brain is more capable of doing those exercises electrically, okay? Uh, if he had too much delta and theta, those exercises aren't going to be as effective. Uh, so we want, we want that specific range with him. So it's brainwave regulation, having people uh, basically understand that they have control over electrical output in their brain. And it's super effective in cases of high anxiety, hypervigilance, uh, explosive behaviors, you know, you were talking about uh, agitation and all of that. Once people realize they have control over these factors, uh, it's a whole different game. It's a whole oh, different yeah. game for them. Yeah. I think that's, you know, just touched on really quickly. You know, people are, you know, I hear all the time that in the ICU, people are told, well, their, their personality is going to change. They're going to be a different person. They're always going to be agitated. They're always going to be, and I tell people always, I don't take that, right? right? Because always, and I think that's really the key thing here is that you guys had these tools to overcome this. I mean, John, we go to a doctor, they said, you're going to find coping mechanisms to take care of John's agitation cope because he's going to always be agitated. Well, let me tell you right now, he's not agitated. That state of agitation is gone. So people need to hear that any kind of emotional, mental, you know, struggle they're going through, it's worth looking into these other modalities because those, there is hope to have a better kind of mental state. Right. And that's so important for people to understand because that's where the caregiver network, the families begin to fracture, um, friend groups especially start to fracture. Um, and these people become more and more isolated. And we see the other end of it where a lot of folks, we see a lot of folks with brain injury that have wound up getting into various aspects of addiction. Yeah. And that is because now they have nothing but a pill or a bottle or something to help them feel connected, to help them feel less pain physically, psychologically, and otherwise. And also too, because they've been, they've had all hope ripped from them uh, because of things like that. And I'll tell you in the vast majority of cases that we've seen or been able to follow long-term, um, those aspects of agitation do come down significantly over time. Uh, Absolutely. It's a phase, you know, in most, in most cases. Really yeah. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. There we go. There you are. And I think that people can get caught in those, um, in, you know, those phases if they're not given the right stimulation. Right. Right. Absolutely. Because, you know, John was stuck in it for such a long time and he was being asked to do the same things in rehab over and over and over. And we were getting just more agitated. Right. Right. That's but then it. once we stepped away and, you know, really keyed into what his brain needed and had a clinician, someone to look on what John's brain needed right. rather than, this worked for most of them, you know, most of them is not John. Right. 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 So, and, and there's yeah. a lot to that too, I think as well, you know, a lot of what we've done with him as many people, particularly in the brain injury arena, because no two are, you know, no two are the same. Um, sometimes it is a bit of experimentation, but we have to observe the experimentation, not just set up an experiment and let that play out for 12 weeks. You know, we, we experiment a little right. bit with uh, new interventions, but it might be for, a half an hour or an hour because we'll learn quickly if it's going to be tolerated well, accepted well by his nervous system, et cetera. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I just, you know, it's ever since I've come to you, it's like, Oh gosh, I just wish we could go there every day. I got to tell those that are listening. It's, it's such a cool experience being at your clinic. I mean, just the way, I mean, it's just, Oh, it's just, it's, it's so cool how it flows, the energy there. It's, um, you know, going back to um, people that are doing too much and just this constant, like not getting anywhere, you know, stimulation so important. And you guys are just very good at um, being respectful of everyone around, right? And just really listening into the, um, into the client or patient that is there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, I feel you know, I, I feel, I don't know how I feel like uh, something Yoda would say, you know, if, if, if you listen, you'll, you'll find the answers, you know, it's, you know, it, it's hard to force things on, on people in these situations. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So what do you, I'm turning into you though? What's that? I tell you, when I'm working with John, I'm turning into you because That's I'll awesome. start like, give me a second. I got to get something. And like, I always find myself having to go get something or like, right. you know, giving him a second, but actually that second gives him a time to regroup and be there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's like you said, Dr. Crawford was calling you Jedi. I love it. That's, uh, <laughs> you know, you have, 
you have to become a student of this stuff. I mean, I see so many caregivers that wind up becoming better clinicians than most clinicians I know. Um, and, you know, to you, exactly. That's a perfect example. Perfect example. And you guys are wonderful. You're just teaching me so much. And I just, I, I feel our purpose is on a bigger level to help educate others and bring awareness to these resources. Yeah. What's your, what's your biggest piece of advice to anybody going through what you've been through? If there's one, I know there's many, but if there's one thing that somebody could put in their advice folder in their email, but put it to the top because it's come from somebody who's, who's been there, done that. What, what's, what's a piece of advice and something maybe even that might help unload somebody rather than adding something to their plate. Right. Number one would be hope. Just kind of like you said, coming in is know that there, the pieces will come into place and just kind of let go of trying to control the whole situation. Right. Um, the body's very interesting and just, you know, take in everyone's advice, but follow your instinct. Really, you know, as a caregiver, you know, if it's right or wrong, right. you know, that person better than anyone else. And if you're getting fed stuff that you just, you know, keep asking questions. Yeah. You can never ask too many questions. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I think that sadly at the beginning of an injury, of any traumatic injuries, you know, the doctors, I mean, they have their place in the ICU. They save lives, right? But from there, they don't do the years beyond that. Right. They get you saved and they, move you along and just remember that and know that that person is alive for a reason and know that there's other people out there that are willing to help right, and right. Um, just let the process unfold. It's not going to, I mean, there are those people that just, you know, bounce right out of it, but when more majority of people, it takes a process and know that it's never too late. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, That's awesome. And the hope factor is so big. I think if there's one thing I'd add to that too is uh, from my end, it's um, not getting into the comparison game um, because that's what we see all the time is, you know, I, can you do that for me? Um, you did that with him. Can you do that for me? And it's a very difficult conversation to have because people see hope in others hope, um, but they can't get into the trap of comparing their situation to somebody else's, whether it's brain injury or ADHD or addiction. Um, but this is something I, I really want to stress to folks as well, because um, you know, the brain is a massive, unique, glorious, stupendous, frustrating, confusing thing. And we just don't know um, where it's going to go with each individual and even throwing statistics on it. That's really, or, or percentages. It's not accurate. It's not fair. So we want to put, uh, you know, we want to instill reasonable hope in people, um, but not have them play the, the comparison game. And I'm sure that happens with you. You hear that quite a bit. All the time. And there's just so many factors to each individual. I mean, just uh, we could go back to even how somebody was born, the, you know, their upbringing. And just there's so many factors into e who each individual is. Right. We all right. are unique in so many different ways. And we just got to keep on remembering that and remembering that, you know, uh, your body is going to be different than someone else's and just accept it and just go through the process and just have positive outlook at it. I think coming down to it all, the hope and just kind of looking at it as every day I'm getting better and just kind of like feed as a caregiver. One thing I would say is just keep the positivity around that person because you know, the person going through the struggle, you really don't know to what capacity they're understanding it. And, um, and if you're down about it and you're talking negatively about it, they're going to feel that and then they're going to take that on as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, I think people appreciate the simple analogies. You know, if you want to lose weight, you don't step on the scale every day. You know, it's right. self-defeating. It's going to, it's, it's not going to work out well. Uh, so you have to take the mile high view. And again, just look at the big picture as opposed to hour by hour, day by day. Right. Yeah. Every little step is a step, I think, that we have to remember that there's no quick fix. If there's right. a quick fix, everybody would be doing it, That's right? It. That's magic it. Magic pill. I would own the right. company if it was just a magic pill. Right. <laughs> We'd all have stock. Right. All right, Laura, I know you've got to get back to John. I have one question for you. Yes. What is like your ultimate, uh, whether self-help or for John or for whatever, just brain health tip? Like what, what's the one, what's your one favorite thing to do for your brain or have John do for his? Ooh, health brain tip. Mm, such a tough one. Um, 
I think the best thing I could say is stepping away from the world and being silent and quiet. Yeah. Because I think we're all overstimulating our brain. Right. It's just, it's going back to that SMR, like you were, you're training with John, you know, finding that calmness and that, you know, really finding if it's meditation or finding, you know, stillness or whatever, just having that time is going to be just breathing like you do with John, just the breath to get a few extra oxygen, just sometimes the basic of the basic things can be life changing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I tell people all the time, you know, it's, it's, if, every, if all of my patients meditated, I'd be out of business and, and I, would, I would enjoy that. I'd have more time to travel. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That mindfulness, that, that present moment-ness, uh, if you will, so, so important. Particularly. Because a, yeah, because we just live in a world that it's just like, go, go, go. And everybody's brains on this like five days ahead or whatever you want to say ahead and just right. not being in the present moment of what is my body telling me right now? Because our bodies are super smart. <laughs> They're going to tell you, yeah. um, you know. So. That's the whole thing. If you're living back here, you're depressed. If you're living far up there, you're anxious. It's uh, you got to be here. Got to be here. Well, awesome. I think Kaya's looking for dinner. I hear. I hear her barking. Here's my dog back there. She probably is. <laughs> That's she awesome. works at the same time every day. Thank All you right. so much for having me. And um, thank you. Thank you. Give John a big hug for me, and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay. All right. Take care. Right. Thank Take you. Care.